All right, welcome back. Um, so I'm gonna start with a matrix that I had uh, written down in the last video. So this was uh, called the identity matrix. So I'm writing big zeros here. So it had ones along the diagonal. So in particular, this is a square matrix. Let's say n by n matrix. Ones along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. And I mentioned that this corresponded um, to the identity transformation. Okay, so this goes from v to v, and it just takes any vector and outputs the same vector. All right, so this matrix, of course, on itself doesn't correspond to any particular vector space or choice of basis, but whenever you have a vector space and you choose a basis and it's the same, you know, same basis chosen for the domain and the range, then the identity map gets written as, as this matrix here, okay? So what we're gonna be interested today uh, is invertible transformations. On the level of matrices, this will correspond to uh, certain matrices that when you take the product with another matrix, you get this identity matrix. Okay, so in terms of transformations, let's say D, T from B to W is linear transformation per usual. Uh, then a right inverse um, S, which goes from W to V, and it satisfies that when I take uh, T composed with S, so this goes from W to W, this is equal to the identity map on W, okay? And similarly, a left inverse uh, for T is going to be a map U, linear transformation, which goes from W up again to V. And when I take T composed with U, I get the identity on V, okay? So maybe I'll start just, so it turns out um, that a linear transformation can have a right inverse and not a left inverse and vice versa. Okay, so maybe I'll do an example not in the context of linear transformations, just in the context of functions. Okay, so I'll just take a function which goes um, from a three-point set to a two-point set. Not the most interesting function. I'm just gonna think of it as, oops, sorry. So zero goes to zero, one goes to one, two goes to one. Uh, notice that F has a right inverse. Okay, so namely that goes sends zero to zero and one goes to one. But, okay. On the other hand, um, F cannot have a left inverse, okay? And this is because, well, if I take, well, f of one is equal to f of two, and therefore if you take two, you know, if there was an inverse function, it would have to assign something to one, and it can't be both one and two, okay? And similarly, you know, you can construct functions from two element sets that don't have, to three element sets that don't have right inverses but have left inverses, okay? So this connects and we'll see this uh, shortly with, you know, injectivity and surjectivity of usual functions. This, it will turn out that the existence of these inverses is gonna be tightly related to these, okay? Um, so let me give you one more definition, okay? So we have right inverses and left inverses. So we say that 
a linear function, linear transformation is invertible, well, if there exists uh, a right inverse and a left inverse, okay? So if there exists a right and a left inverse uh, for t, okay? And, <clears throat> well, this is already uh, something that we want to improve a little bit, okay? So we're going to, I mean, it's a little annoying to have to deal with right and left inverses. Generally, of course, matrix multiplication isn't commutative, right? So there is a difference between ST and TS, okay? But it will turn out, or this is a theorem that we'll prove now, that if you're invertible, okay? So if you have this left and right inverse, um, this is true if and only if there is um, another linear transformation, which I'm gonna call like the inverse of t, okay? So that t composed with t inverse is the same as t inverse, oh, sorry, not the same. This is the identity on w, and this is the identity on b, okay? So in other words, invertibility gives you two linear transformations, Okay, and this theorem is telling you that actually you only need one, okay? Um, so there's one which, which is both a right and a left inverse. Okay, so how do we prove this? Um, so it's going to follow essentially from associativity of, of composition of linear maps. So first notice this way, this direction is trivial, okay? If I have this t inverse, then that's both the right and the left inverse. So I get that, that t is invertible, okay? So on the other hand, um, t is invertible. So I get the existence of um, t composed with s. I'll just say this, which is equal to the identity on w and u composed with t which is equal to the identity on V. And then I can look at the map U composed with T composed with S. So this goes from W uh, to V, okay? So on one hand, this is U composed with T composed with S, or it's U composed with T composed with S. Here, this is the identity on W. This is the identity on V, so you get that S is equal to U, okay? So therefore, you can write S as U as, as the T inverse, and the T inverse satisfies what we want, okay? Um, so let me give you some more examples that we've seen of invertible transformations, okay? Uh, so let me do examples. Okay, so rotation, or rotations, I'm just going to do of R2, and reflections over lines in R2. Okay, so both of these are invertible. Again, you, can, you should think um, kind of a necessary assumption for it to be invertible is that it's a bijection, right? And then what you would like is that the inverse is also a linear transformation, okay? Uh, so the, for rotation, so if I'm rotating clockwise, so I'll do, well, so rotate by an angle alpha, this was cosine alpha minus sine alpha, minus sine alpha cosine alpha. Okay, so you can check that the inverse um, is um, R minus alpha, okay? So rotating clockwise, about the same number of radians. Um, of course, you can uh, do this by, you know, I mean, geometrically, it's obvious, okay? But you can also write down the matrices. Okay, 
okay, and check that if you have cosine alpha sine alpha minus sine alpha cosine alpha and then cosine minus alpha sine minus alpha. I know I could write this as cosine alpha and minus sine of alpha, but I'm just gonna keep everything to this. Okay, so if you multiply this out, you will just get the matrix corresponding to the identity on R2, okay? But this is, I mean, it's a good thing to check, write down the matrices and multiply them out. Um, so another, um, for reflections, okay. Uh, well, in this case, again, this is through some line, y is alpha x uh, going through the origin. In this case, it turns out that the reflection uh, is its own inverse, okay? So I gave you, I, I won't write down the formula for, for the general um, reflection, okay? But it turns out that if you do this, uh, or go back to the lec lecture video, you can check that when you multiply r by itself, you get back to the identity, okay? So this is usually written as like r squared is one. Okay, um, and an, an example that, that doesn't have uh, invertible transformation would be projection. Again, I've written down formulas here for this. Uh, and in this case, if we project down onto a line, uh, this won't be invertible. Okay, so this, again, since this is surjective, but, but not injective, this is going to have a right inverse, uh, but not a left inverse. Oops. Okay, again, this is kind of a useful exercise to go to each of these matrices and try to see if you can figure out, you know, what makes this projection not have an inverse um, and these reflections and rotations have them. Okay, we'll, we'll see much more of this uh, soon, okay. Okay, so let me just, maybe I'll make this explicit um, since I've talked about invertible matrices. Um, so just a matrix is invertible And similarly, left to right invertible um, if the corresponding uh, linear transformation is. Okay. Uh, and in other words, this is the same, if, since we know that composition is the same as matrix multiplication, it's the same as saying A inverse of A so matrix A is invertible, is A, A inverse is this identity matrix, okay? Okay, so let me give you a, a useful theorem, um, which, I mean, for us, it, it will mostly help showing certain um, transformations are invertible, okay? It's analogous to the fact that a composition of two bijections is a bijection, okay? So if linear transformations T uh, and U are invertible, okay, and uh, T composed with, or U composed with T makes sense, okay, so you can, you can do it, okay. Um, on the matrix level, I'm saying this is the same as saying I have two matrices and you can multiply them, right? Uh, then, well, uh, U composed with T is invertible. Uh, and its inverse is just uh, T, oh, uh, let's see, T inverse composed with U inverse. Okay, so the thing to remember is that you have to change um, this order, okay, and the proof is very simple, okay, it's just saying that u composed with t 
composed with T inverse composed with U inverse is the identity and uh, T inverse composed with U inverse composed with U composed with T is the identity, okay? And this is just both of these follow from associativity of composition or, or matrix multiplication, whichever you prefer, okay? So maybe I'll just, I'll give a, a side remark, okay? Um, what this is saying <clears throat> is that the, um, maybe I'll, okay, I'll put it in terms of matrices. That's how it's usually uh, stated here. So the invertible matrices um, with coefficients in any field uh, form a, what's called a group, okay, with respect to matrix multiplication. So really, I mean, all this is saying is that, well, there's a, there's a certain operation which lets you take, you know, as input to invertible matrices and output their product. There's an identity, okay, which is just the matrix, um, I n. I mean, this is obviously an invertible matrix. Okay, that's what the group. That's all that is kind of required from a group structure, plus some axioms that are certainly satisfied by matrix multiplication. Okay, um, so this is a very important group. So I'm going to mention it's usually called G L N O of R or of C or of F. Okay, so this is called the general linear group. So it's just a set of invertible uh, n by n matrices. You can think when I, you know, said that we're going to um, describe, you know, at the beginning of the course, I wanted to study vector spaces and their symmetries. You can think of this as really like the honest symmetries of a vector of a vector space, or at least of R n. Okay, in the sense that they're bijections, right? That's a, usually something that we assume of a symmetry, right? It turns out that I want to think of a symmetry as far more general, just as a linear transformation. But if you're most interested in the invertible linear transformations, because you like stuff like reflections and rotations, that's, that's perfectly fine, okay? So this is, this is just a very important group. That comes up when you're studying various questions about symmetries of, of many spaces. Okay, so let me um, put in another um, theorem, I guess, or lemma that I won't prove. Um, so if, if A is a matrix, and A the T is the transpose, okay, then um, well, you would like to know what the inverse of the transpose is, and it turns out it has an obvious formula. So A transpose inverse is just the inverse uh, transpose. Okay, so I'm going to leave this proof as an exercise once you know how to... It's very similar to, to the last um, proposition or theorem about uh, composition of linear transformations. Okay, so let me um, just make another remark or something that I will probably say or maybe have already said without thinking about it. Okay, so if T from V to W is an invertible uh, linear transformation, okay, uh, then, well, I'm going to, then we, we say just by definition, that a V and W are isomorphic. Okay, so, I'll and I'll write something like this. Okay, v is equivalent to W. 
So we've seen an example of this um, before, right? Where we had Rn and Pn polynomials, degree less than or equal to n. Okay. This had a standard basis e1 through en, and this had a standard basis of monomials. Okay. And then you can map, uh, you know, the ith basis vector to t to the i. And I mentioned earlier that, well, this essentially, well, so, so what this happens to induce, so this induces an invertible uh, linear transformation, okay, from Rn to Pn. And so up to this relabeling of basis vectors, you get the same vector space, okay, so, and, and you can't really distinguish them. And we saw that, you know, there was there were reasons to consider, you know, space of polynomials versus Rn. Like, you know, there were naturally defined subspaces here that were hard to think of over here. Um, but just as honest vector spaces, if you have this bijection between them, which is linear, then uh, we think of them as the same vector space. Okay? So maybe I'll note that this, this is generally uh, a true... <clears throat> or extends to the general case. So if I have V and W uh, vector spaces with bases of the same uh, cardinality, okay, then they are isomorphic. Okay, then v is isomorphic to w, okay? And what you do is, well, you take a basis, let's just say they have the same cardinality of n, okay? So you have v1 through vn, a basis here, w1 up through wn, a basis of w. You send vi to wi, and then you um, extend linearly so, you know, I'll make it explicit. So you send, you know, alpha one V one up through alpha N V N just goes to alpha one W one up through alpha N W N. Okay. And then you can check that the, just the going the other way, you extend linearly, but you start by sending W I to V I and this extends to the inverse, okay? So the inverse linear transformation. All right, so it turns out that if you're just looking at vector spaces up to isomorphism, then they're only uh, distinguishable by the number of elements in a basis. Okay, so let me note, I, I am assuming that these are vector spaces over the same field, okay? So if I had an R vector space with two basis vectors, that's not the same as a isomorphic to a complex vector space with two basis vectors, but if they are over the same field, then, then this will work. Okay, so let me um, prove now one of the the main theorem of this, uh, of this lecture, okay? It, it's going to essentially uh, just say that invertible transformations are surjective, okay? Um, so let uh, T going from B to W be linear transformation. Okay. Then uh, T is invertible. Uh, if and only if, okay, for every vector in W, uh, there's a unique uh, V in V so that T of V is V. I'm sorry, T of V is W, okay? So in other words, um, you know, this maybe this seems clear because I've been talking about bijections, what this is saying is that a linear transformation 
is invertible if and only if it's a bijection. So maybe let me note here that like being a bijection gives an inverse, you know, as a function, right? So in other words, I know that there's some inverse function, but the hard part is to show that this is also invertible. Okay, so if you think of these as just functions between sets and you have a linear transformation and it's invertible, there's no a priori reason why the inverse also has to be a linear transformation, but, but this is what we show, okay? Uh, so let me show the um, easier part first. So this is, we want to assume that it, it's invertible and show that this is a bijection. Okay, so, well, we want to let um, w and w, okay? Then since we have an inverse, we can take v to be t inverse of w. Okay? Then, of course, t of t inverse of w is w, so we are good there. And now we just have to check that it's unique. Well, if there was another vector, so if there was another v, we'll call this v prime and v, so that t of v prime was equal to w, well, then we can multiply um, or compose with the inverse on the left-hand side. So we get t inverse composed with t of v prime is t inverse of w, on the other hand, this is v, and since this is the identity, this is v prime. Okay, so v prime equals v. Okay, so now suppose that we have a bijection. Okay, so for every for every uh, w, there's this unique v. Well, there's an obvious way to define the inverse, right? We just define the inverse function and hope that it's uh, invertible, or hope that it's a linear transformation, and hope it's linear. So in other words, we have t going from v to w, define a map from w to v, which just sends w to v, where this is the unique v and v, so that t of v is equal to w. Okay, so exactly the inverse is a function. So why is this linear? Okay, well, it's gonna follow from uh, t being linear. Okay, so what we need to check, maybe I will call this, okay, maybe I won't call it t inverse yet. Okay, not that lucky. Um, so, so to check that, um, u of alpha 1 w 1 up through alpha n w n is equal to alpha 1 u of w 1 plus alpha n u of w n. Okay, so then, well, let's let v uh, i be u of wi. Okay, so in other words, we know that t of vi is equal to wi. Well, then we know, so we know that if we take t of alpha 1 v1 up through alpha n vn, we get alpha 1 w1 plus alpha n wn by a linearity of t. So in other words, uh, since t is linear, we know that u of alpha 1 w1 up through alpha n wn must be 
alpha 1 v 1 plus alpha n v n, okay, by the definition of u. But on the other hand, this is precisely alpha 1 u of w 1 up through alpha n u of w n, again by the definition of u. Okay? So that's the proof. Uh, let me just give you one, I mean, a picture to kind of uh, see what's going on here. So if we have, say, vectors w1 and w2, so this is in w over here is v, well, we know that there's these unique vectors v1 and v2, which map onto them, right, by the map t. And what we're trying to do is define this map u by just taking the pre-image, so w2 goes here, and u goes here, and then where you're, you're wondering where to send uh, w1 plus w2, so you're wondering about what the pre-image of w1 plus w2 is, well, since, oops, not drawing that right, since t is linear, we know that the thing that maps onto w1 plus w2 is exactly v1 plus v2, okay? And there, therefore, that's going to give us linearity in the other direction, same as, basically the same picture for scalar multiplication, okay? Okay, so let me make um, kind of a special definition, no, I mean a, a special example of a linear transformation. Um, and maybe, well, I guess I'll say this in a second. So uh, if I have a vector space V, um, and two different bases, so two bases, um, V1 up through Vn, and let's just say W1 up through Wn, okay? And I'm thinking of these now as, as ordered in some sense. I mean, it's not gonna um, really matter, okay? But I wanna think of them as an ordered list of elements. Um, define a change of basis matrix or linear transformation. Though since we've already chosen bases, it's gonna be in some sense more natural to think of them as matrices. Um, to be the unique um, invertible uh, matrix slash transformation, uh, which sends Uh, vi to wi, okay? So you write down a list of basis vectors, you order them in some way, if you have different orderings, you'll get uh, different matrices, and then there's this unique matrix which just sends um, uh, the ith basis vector of one basis to the ith basis vector of the other basis, okay? So maybe I'm just going to slip in this remark. I essentially said it, I think, earlier, but uh, a linear transformation actually between two vector spaces is invertible if and only if uh, bases get sent to bases. Okay, so any basis that you input for V will go to a basis for W if it's an invertible linear transformation, okay? If you have a fixed vector space and um, two different bases, you get um, this specific change of basis matrix, okay? So we've seen these examples, okay, um, a couple times. Usually when I wanted to rewrite a matrix in a particularly nice basis. Let me just do like a first example, okay, which is if you just take Rn and then you start with, with one of the bases um, 
being the, the standard coordinate basis, I'll just call this E1 through EN, standard basis, then you have um, W1 through WN any other basis, okay? Then the matrix, well again, the way that we write down the matrix for the linear, um, you know, for the linear transformation, which sends EI to WI, is to just write down a matrix with, you know, T of EI is the ith column. So in other words, the columns are going to be W1, W2, up through WN. Okay? So, for example, if we had seen the basis uh, of R2 given by 1, 1, and 1, 0, you can check this is a basis of R2, since we're going to get a linear invertible transformation here. Okay, the change of basis just is 1, well, so it... Again, it depends on the ordering. I'm going to send 1, 0 to itself and 0, 1 to 1, 1. Okay, so this takes uh, the basis 1, 0, 0, 1 to 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay, and by taking compositions of... Uh, these matrices, we can actually do the general case, right? So again, I'll just do Rn, okay? Um, so we're going to have two bases, uh, V1 up through Vn and W1 up through Wn, okay? Then we know how to get from E1 uh, to En goes to V1 up through Vn. This is just the matrix with uh, the Vi's here. Okay, so V1, V2, up through Vn. Similar, so maybe I'll call this matrix A, okay? And then we have matrix B, which sends E1, oops, up through En to W1 up through Wn, and this has columns just the Wi's, okay? And then to get from V1 through V2, so Rn to Rn, just sending the Vi to the Wi, well, first you take Ai a inverse, okay, so you start with A inverse, and then compose with B, okay, so if you say, so first you're going here, and then here, so EIB of VI is equal to WI, okay? Okay, so that's the general formulation, um, so I'll do another just explicit example of this, let's suppose we have R2, um, and let's suppose, I don't know, we're looking at 1, 1, negative 2, 2. This is one basis. And then we have another basis, I don't know, 2, negative 1, 2, 1. Okay? And we want a linear transformation, which... Uh, which is invertible and sends one basis to another, well, you know, you just apply the formula, okay? So what you get is, well, first the matrix A, in this case, takes things uh, to, to the VI, so it's 1, 1, minus 2, 2, and then the matrix B, Again, you have to care, you know, you have to distinguish which of the or, you know, which ordering you want. So I'll just do 2, 1 and 2, minus 1. All right. And then B, A inverse uh, sends 
the two basis vectors to the two basis vectors. Okay, so on the other hand, let me just say this raises the question or um, the concern, we're going to need a nice way, so hopefully a computable way, to find uh, A inverse, okay? Like as a matrix. Okay, so, so we'll see this um, relatively soon, but obviously if you want to compute, you know, if you want to work with these change of basis matrices, we know that we can do it. We know that we can find this linear transformation um, which sends one to the other. On the other hand, it doesn't really, you know, we haven't really found it in the sense that, you know, I know where the vector 1, 0, and 0, 1 go. Okay, so I don't know what this looks like as a matrix with respect to the standard basis. And that's obviously something that, that we're going to want to know, right? Because we want to work out what these change of basis matrices actually are. Okay, so finally, um, I'd like to just kind of re-emphasize uh, this connection between invertible matrices and systems of linear equations. Okay. Okay, so we saw that A, which I'll think of as linear transformation or matrix, so it's invertible um, if and only if for any B in Y, the, the equation AX equals B has a unique solution, okay? So now thinking of um, A as a matrix and writing X and B in the, in the coordinates that they're given by the bases, what we have is a matrix AIJ, X1 up through Xn is equal to B1 up through Bn, okay? So in other words, A11, X1, I mean, we get a system of linear equations, A12, x2 up through a1n xn should be b1 a12 oops x ah sorry so a21 x1 plus a22 x2 up through a2n xn is b2 and all the way down to an1 x1 and then plus a n n x n is equal to b sub n. Okay. And <clears throat> on the other hand, if you're solving um, a system of linear equations, well, usually you're you start here. Okay, and you want to find a solution. And now we know what to do, right? So this involves. Um, you know, I guess I, I'm looking at the special case now when you have n solutions or n, n equations and n variables, okay? Um, you can do a similar thing, um, and we'll see for other systems, okay? So solving this system involves finding um, A inverse, okay? And then the solution... is x is a inverse of b, okay? So if you want to find a solution to a system of linear equations, well, you're going to be given the coefficients, so, and, and the thing that you want to, to hit, so you'll, you'll be given b, you'll be given a, and then the key is going to be, well, first determining when this is invertible, okay, so determine when invertible, okay, and then 
you know, find it, okay? So this is just another motivation for, an, you know, if you're given a matrix, you, you want to know um, how to find its inverse in an efficient manner because that's going to um, give you the solution to the system, okay? All right, so I think that's a good place to stop today, so thanks.